much for uh, being here tonight for this uh, second uh, Cambridge Creativity Meetup. Uh, this meetup was born from, from a group of alumni from the um, Institute for Continuing Education's um, uh, course on uh, creativity theory. Uh, Alex Carter, who is here tonight uh, as uh, one of the attendants, uh, can give you uh, more information about that if you're interested. Um, and so we, we were looking for a way to keep contact and to keep uh, all the very uh, fruitful and interesting debates that we're having about creativity. Hence the idea of uh, inviting uh, creative people uh, for a talk, but also uh, uh, helping uh, the audience, you guys, to um, interact and have debates about uh, creativity, uh, chats, you know, exchanging experience um, about uh, uh, this very, very vast thing that creativity is. Um, tonight, uh, um, I, I'm really, really looking forward for this talk. Um, we have a, a speaker who I've done some uh, work with uh, in the past. Uh, uh, she's, a, she's a coach, executive coach, um, and uh, you know she's got a fantastic, fantastic energy. Every time she comes uh, to, to a room, it's like a ray of sunshine. Every, every discussion I've had uh, with her was really uh, positive and really uh, uh, motivating. And that uh, pertains to one aspect of creativity, which is sometimes we're not quite sure if we can do it. We're, you know, we have this kind of perhaps self-doubt or we have maybe things which are stopping us from taking that jump, that leap of faith to creativity. So please um, push the hand clap button <laughs> to give a big, big welcome uh, to uh, Kate Togero tonight. Thank you very much. Kate, all yours. Thank you very much. And what, oh, what, a, what a very humbling introduction. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that hugely. I'm, um, as Sasha said, I'm, I'm an executive coach um, and I work with tiny little cutting edge startups, technology, all sorts of business through to some of the or many of, of the largest corporations in the world. Um, and I very, feel very privileged to work, work all over the world, though obviously at the moment I work all over the world from right here. Um, love what I do. Um, and I suppose one of the things I'm so excited to be talking here this evening, because when um, Sasha invited me, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not an artist. I'm not a designer. I'm not an engineer. I don't put myself in that creative bracket. I've got two daughters, one's 11, one's 18. And I was talking to my little one about school and, you know, and creativity. And she was saying, oh, well, I can't do drawing. And I thought, oh, you know, and, and creativity, I don't think is taught very well at school because, you know, to reference my elder daughter, we went to the Royal Academy. Um, in fact, Sam de Cruz joined us as well. We went to the Royal Acad Academy Summer Winter Exhibition um, last week before this second lockdown happened. Um, we were talking about creativity and how it's taught in schools. And my 18 year old was saying, but it's ridiculous because creativity is in absolutely every single thing that we do. And of course it is, whether that's our job, whether that's our life, whether that's our home, whether that, you know, that's something that we're trying to create. So to say I'm delighted to be here would be an understatement. And I'm very grateful that you've, you've asked me. Um, I think one of the things that um, creates possibility. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Art of Possible and everything that I'm going to talk about this evening is about creating your possible if you like, what is possible for you, realizing your potential, um, you know, how do you get unstuck, how do you get over those hurdles and I think one of those things that creates possibility is presence and of course we're not always present, we're not always in the moment. So. Um, I was going to ask you all a question that you might reflect on. Between one and 10, how present are you? So 10 is your hung on my every word and everything I'm saying. And one might be bake offs on later, need to watch another episode of The Crown, haven't actually got any pasta and I quite fancy pasta cat needs food or whatever else, which of course happens all the time in life. We're, we're sort of sitting here, but our head is wherever it is. So whatever answer you had there, 
and, and I use that quite a lot in meetings, if you can tell that the energy's drifted, what would it take for you to maybe get a bit more present? Maybe think about where you're seated. Have you got your feet on the ground? Can you ground yourself a bit more? So I think that um, that was, you know, how present are we to create our, our possibility, if you like? And I think one thing that certainly happened in the last pandemic, this pandemic rather that we're all living in, that we'll all be so viscerally aware of is that, um, you know, it, it's affected everybody to a greater or lesser degree. But I think moreover, um, it's forced us all to navel gaze or to look ourselves in the mirror and to reflect a bit more on who we are. And for many of us who like being busy and running away from who we are, that maybe has been a bit uncomfortable. But that said, if we're thinking about our dreams, our achievements, you know, the things that you want to achieve, actually to have that time to reflect on what you love, what you're excited by or what you hate, actually is, is quite a joy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my story with you um, or my, my background, if you like, just so you know a bit about me. Then I'm going to share a little story about how my book came about. And then I picked some sort of highlights, if you like, from the book, which are about about the book, really, about achieving your your possible, achieving, achieving what you can. Um, the reason I thought I'll tell you my story, some of you might love it, some of you hate it and it's really dull. But as humans, we love stories. We love listening to stories. So whether we love it or loathe it, hopefully it will it will provoke a thought. So what I thought I'd do is I was I was reading something the other day that was talking about um, talking about the contours of our career or our life, actually, which I thought was quite interesting. So I think when we go to school, it's sort of you, you'll do these exams and then that'll happen. And then you do those exams and then that'll happen. And then you go to university and then you might travel and then you might meet someone and then you'll get a great job and then another job. And, and it's, it's beautiful, this lovely line. But of course, as we all know, life doesn't go like that. It goes up, then it goes down, then it goes down a bit further, then it goes up and it, and it all happens. So I didn't just shared, I thought I'd be very real about this. I'll share the ups and the downs and how it's got me to where I am today. So when I, when I was little, when I was a very little girl, I was a, I was a real daddy's girl. Um, my dad was a photographer. Um, he used to take loads of photography, he used to take me out lots and it was, you know, for walks, had pets with the dog. Um, I was very small, so I, I, don't, I don't remember it so clearly but it, it, was, it was fantastic and we had a really great experience. And then that was an up. And then that hit a bit of a down when um, I was 11 and my dad's eyesight took a massive hit um, and diminished. And at the same time, he hit the bottle. Um, and I don't know whether the two were connected, but to my 11 year old brain, brain, the one happened and then so did the other. And so, uh, the down of that was that home life and school became very, very tough. Um, but the up was I got through school and I got some O levels, that's showing my age, GCSEs as they're now known. And that was good. Then my father got really bad again um, and I flunked all my A levels. Now, whilst I was working at um, Marks and Spencer, um, Sassy Girl, as many, many of us did to sort of fund us through our education. Um, I, I worked at M&S in Richmond and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I decided that I was going to go on the um, graduate management training program to go into retail. That was my plan. That was what I wanted to do. Um, and then I failed all my A-levels. So there became a massive flaw in that plan. And so one Saturday afternoon after work, I went to my manager and said, don't know what to do, but I want your job one day. I was incredibly shy when I was 20. So whether that was 20 years of bold, just bubbled up in one moment, I have no idea. But up until that point, there's no way on earth I would have done that. But I did. And I said, I've just failed all my A-levels, not going to get to university, clearly can't do that. What do you suggest? And he said, start work here at quarter to five on Monday morning and show, you what, show me what you're made of. So I did. And I worked there for many, many years. And that was great. And I got a number of promotions, which again was fantastic. And then um, and then one Friday afternoon, it was he called me into his office and he said, um, I want to ask you a question. He said. Um, on the Marks and Spencer's management training program, there are four places for non-graduates. 
and they're people that have come through stores, which many of you may know. There were 400 places, four for non-graduates. And he said, if you're willing to put the work in, I'm willing to back you. Think about it over the weekend. Tell me Monday morning. I didn't have to think about it over, over the weekend. I told him there and then that is what I want to do. So long story short, that is what I did. He backed me and I got one of those four places, which was utterly fantastic. And I absolutely loved it. Um, worked for MS for about seven, eight years, worked in various different departments, got the most fantastic grounding in, in everything, um, you know, from merchandising through to marketing and HR and, um, you know, the, the, the working with graduates, all sorts of things. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and then I got probably the biggest promotion I'd ever got. Well, yes, of course it was. It was clearly the, because it was, it was the last one I had. And unfortunately, my boss also had a drink problem. And at that stage, my dad was really quite ill um, and m and had lost their AAA rating. But I don't think that was related to my father and my new boss. Um, anyway, for one reason or another, that didn't work. So I thought, oh, oh, anyway, I parted company. I look back and think clearly that was just too much. And I left. Unbeknownst to me, a friend had got my CV, which was olden days and a bit of paper from a drawer via my mother. And he, he wasn't a boyfriend, um, it was a friend, and he knew I wanted to travel. And he sent my paper CV with a photograph. To this day, I've never seen the photograph, and I'd only known him from going out in the evenings, dancing and stuff, so who knows what was on the photograph. He sent it off to an airline, and he thought, if she wants to travel, she can go be an air stewardess. I said, I don't want to be an air stewardess. There's no way I want to be an air stewardess. I, you know, I, I want to travel differently. Anyway, I got the job. And I've always believed that if you get an interview, even if you don't want the job, you go to the interview because you never, ever know who you might meet. Um, so I went to the interview and I got the job. Well, I didn't. I got the next interview. So three, fourth interview in um, was all about um, the world, the globe. And they'd ask you questions like if you're in Dublin and you want to get to Dar Salaam, when do you cross the equator? Where do you go? And my my navigational skills are, are rubbish. You will, they really are. So I had to know the globe for 24 hours to get through this interview. And to this day, I couldn't tell you answer to any of those questions. And even now, I don't know my left and my right. But I got the job and it was it was fantastic. So I ended up living in the Middle East. Um, I ended up riding um, fantastic Arab stallions in the desert, traveling and seeing the world in a way that I couldn't have done because I certainly couldn't have afforded to see some of the places I did. I did that for about a year. Didn't want to do it forever and then I came home so that was a bit of a down. Up, met my husband, um, that was great. Um, a bit of a down, my dad had a really really nasty car accident, broke his neck, knocked someone off a motorbike, broke their ribs, broke their leg and hit someone in a car so that was a bit rubbish, that was three weeks before I got married. Um, anyway, I still got married, he survived to live the tale um, and that was all good. I'd started a business few years before that went belly up that was a bit rubbish and then I had my daughter so that was an amazing thing I'm nearly at the end <laughs> then in 2005 my daughter ended up at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital and there's a reason I'm telling you that I also got made redundant and lost two members of my family so that was a pretty rough year and then the year after I set this business up so I'm just going through the little you know up and down of life after that um I, when I started my business in 2006, that was the business I do now, which I absolutely love in executive coaching, leadership training. Um, I, through networks and asking, I became a faculty member at Google Learn, which is brilliant. Um, I became an associate faculty member at Cambridge University, which is probably one of the most thrilling things because as I've told you all, I didn't go to university. So when that was offered to me, it was just magic, as you can imagine, utterly magical. Um, had my youngest daughter, that was great. And in 2011, I learned how to ride an off-road motorbike and took it over a mountain. Um, I'm gonna tell you more about that in a moment. It was a four day trip and I only managed one day. So that was a bit rough. And for about six months, I felt utterly like a failure. 2014, I wrote the, my book, The Art of Possible. Um, and, um, and then various things have happened over the last few years, which have been which have been fabulous. Some of them have come from writing the book, from learning to ride a motorbike, um, 
Last year, lost lost a very good friend. That was very tough. And then this year, I actually finished a novel that I started five years ago. Um, and I started a podcast a couple of weeks ago with my daughter. So, you know, those contours that everyone talks about and those journeys that we take, you know, we look back and we can see that even in the face of utter adversity or how on earth am I going to get out from this? Actually, it makes us who we are. And I think, you know, that reflection on those, you know, the tough days, but also the amazing days. And from, I suppose, a perspective of when I work as a coach, really leaning into that stuff, the stuff you've been through and the stuff that you do really well. Because I often find when I work with individuals, those things that you're really good at, those things that are absolutely your strength, people tend to brush off as, well, everyone does that. Well, no, everyone doesn't do that, actually. But of course, we have to reflect and we have to think a bit just to know what they are. And then we can lean in them into them. So. Um, what I want to talk about now and which came from when I wrote the book, um, which were well, the catalyst, the failure of not achieving that four day trip was all around um, getting comfortable with discomfort. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, and I thought, I'm an, I'm an executive coach, so of course I, I will write a book based on my experience. And, um, and I thought, I need someone that's going to add rigor to my reflections, you know, my reflections on the CEOs I've spoken to, the founders of companies that I've spoken to, people from all walks of life that actually will add some rigor to what I've observed of, of successful people or people that have achieved and have overcome or have done whatever it is that they want to do. So I worked with a, with a neuroscientist and she was, she was, she was fascinating. Um, and we talked about getting comfortable with discomfort and how I got comfortable with discomfort. And I'm gonna tell you another little story and then I'll move on. Is that a night much like this evening not that cold, but a bit wet and a bit windy and a bit miserable, I decided to watch The Long Way Round. And The Long Way Round is, um, is if any of you are bikers out there, or even if you're not bikers, you might have heard of it. The Long Way Round is when Charlie Borman and Ewan McGregor went 19,000 miles around the world, 12 different countries in 35 days, I think. Um, now, shallow moment, I fancy Ian McGregor a bit, so I think that was probably why on a bit of a cold November evening I chose to watch that particular DVD. But I looked at it and thought, oh, I want to learn to ride a motorbike, a big BMW motorbike like they do. Now my husband rides a motorbike and I said, I want to do that. And he gave me one of those looks like when we spoke to a friend or a colleague or a family member and say, guess what I'm gonna do? And they go, yeah, all right. You'll, you'll go to bed in the morning, you'll be, you, you'll forgot you've even said that. Anyway, I didn't. I thought, no, I do want to do that. I do want to learn to ride a motorbike. Now, I did actually have the piece of paper or the bit on my license that says I can ride a motorbike. I have passed my motorbike test, but I passed my motorbike test 14 years ago. And as you all know, when you get a certificate or when you pass a test or get a license to do something, that's day one. You actually learn how to do whatever it is, whether it's riding a motorbike, whether it's psychotherapy, or it's chiropathy, whether it's code, whatever it is, it comes after you've got the certificate. So whilst I had a bit of paper that theoretically said this woman can ride a motorbike, I didn't really have any experience at all. So I had a massive learning curve. And I decided to do a trip over the Pyrenees to raise funds for Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital where our daughter was in, um, in 2005. And I'm just gonna share one little moment on that trip. And I was on my motorbike. I'd actually bought a new one for the trip because all the way through my, lear my learning, I, had a, I just had a, a, a two stroke um, and I got an automatic, um, not an automatic, I got a, um, a, a four stroke and, a, and an automatic start because I had a kickstart before and I thought on the side of a mountain, kickstarting a motorbike, if you've only got one foothold might be a bit tricky. So from a purely practical perspective, I thought I need to sort that out. And I was, um, you won't be surprised to hear, I did this trip with 14 other guys. I was the only woman there. I discovered the night before that not only was I the only woman there, but I'd only actually been riding a motorbike for 12, no, 12 months. Um, nine months and everyone else there have been riding since they were probably about 12 
And this was the hardest, one of the hardest trips on the planet for off-road bikers to do. I had absolutely no idea. I was sat next to this chap called Ian. I remember him as if he's sitting there next to me now. And he went forward and he said, I competed at the weekend and I parked my bike on the tree that the nighter normally uses. And I thought, it's okay, don't panic. There's lots of people called night, I'm sure. David's relatively well-known name. There must be lots of people called David Knight because he'd mentioned the nighter. And, uh, and someone else down the table said, oh, wow, I, I raced with him the other week. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, David Knight, the nighter, who usually propped his bike up against said tree, is nine-time world champion on an off-road motorcycle. So i am been riding an off-road motorbike for nine months, and all my colleagues compete with the world champion every weekend. To say I was out of my depth was just ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. But weirdly, it didn't deter me. I decided the next morning that I was going to go with them. That's what I trained for. That's what I decided I was going to do. And I wanted to raise some money. In the middle of the first morning, I was on a patch of rock about the size of a dining table. My bike was running. I only mentioned that because I used to stall a lot. So it was actually a really good thing that it was still running. And up next to me was well I say a slope but it was the side of a mountain really and it was running with water and there was shale and there was moss and there was loose bits of rock and and it just looked really slippery and really horrible and I thought I can't do that I, just, I remember just sitting there put both feet on the ground and thought I can't do that and I'm completely on my own 15 other 16 other they're long gone I'm completely on my own so I look at my phone no signal of course of course no signal on the side of the Pyrenees in 32 degree heat um so I thought right okay and I thought well maybe someone will walk past and I'm sort of in the undergrowth had someone walked past I'd have given them my boots my kit my helmet my bike gladly but that didn't happen so that wasn't an option and so I remember sitting there for a minute thinking well how am I going to get out of this one and I then thought, do you know what? I've been trained by some of the best bikers in this country. A lady who's one of only two women to do the Dakar, a chap called Cy Pavey, who's done the Dakar many, many times, a mechanic for himself, um, and even ridden with Charlie Borman. I'll tell you about that later, another story. And I thought, I've been taught by some of the best people in this country. I have the skill, but my head's going to override and tell me I can't do it. And of course, I then thought about, I don't know why, but two weeks before I'd worked with an executive team in Barcelona in a really, really beautiful hotel. It overlooked the sea. It was really stunning. But the team I was working with, well, they weren't warm and fuzzy. <laughs> And I didn't actually warm to any of them. It was really tough. They were quite dysfunctional, I think is the best word to use at this stage. And, but after three days, I got them to a good place in terms of how they were working as a team. And I thought, you know, if I can work with those guys, they weren't all guys, guys and girls, that team, I can get this motorbike up this mountain. But then I thought, not one, not one single one of those children at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital has chosen to be there. And I, however, have chosen to be on the back of a motorbike that frankly terrifies me ever so slightly in all this gear and learnt and want to raise money. I have put myself in this position, so I have to get myself out of it. Um, and I did. I did what I needed to do. The reason I mention all those people and all those people that trained me is prior to that trip, I did not know any of them, not one of them. Um, and I asked, I asked the question, you know, wanted to do something, wanted to achieve something, so, something, so, so I had to ask them. And I completely put myself out of my comfort zone and actually, but actually didn't allow the fear to interfere and knew that actually, you know, you, you often that the, the fear that we sort of hold is not necessarily of what we're doing but actually what might happen afterwards so one of the things i'm going to reference some of the other things in a moment but one of the things i think if we can get comfortable with being uncomfortable particularly if you're talking about um 
you know, creativity, realizing your potential, whatever your goals are, the better we are at getting comfortable with discomfort, the more able we're going to do that. And aside from getting on a motorbike, which you really don't need to do, one of the easiest ways to do it is by listening to different music. If you're a classical fan, listen to hip hop. If you're a hip hop fan, listen to hard rock. Listen to something that's completely different because your brain will have to work harder. You know, and, and those, um, those, those neural pathways will get stronger. The, the synapses will, will, will fire more because you have to work harder. It's the same with you know, the food you eat. Eat something different. Eat something that you wouldn't normally. Read books that you wouldn't read. I'm reading a book about... Um, it's quite brutal, actually. It's, it's about terrorism and and war. And um, a, a guy I know wrote it, who's a former army captain. I really love a chick flick. So actually, that, you know, that that's challenging me a bit, but it's making my brain work. It's the same with journalists, you know, read a journalist that actually winds you up, you know, read something that is very, very different to what you would normally do and you will grow your hipp hippocampus and you know you'll take a different route and therefore when you are faced with that really challenging scenario you've learned how to put yourself in a place of discomfort so it's a little bit easier um, but as i say you don't need to get on a motorbike to do that but what that motorbike trip did do is it acted as a catalyst to writing the book? Because as I said earlier, it felt like an utter failure that I only did day one. I did day one because as you can imagine with those 16 people, I was so out of my comfort zone, it was ridiculous. And I thought someone else might get themselves into a difficult situation because they have to help me and I'm not prepared for that to happen. So I pulled out. But actually when I look back, I thought, you know, if I can do that, anybody can do anything. You know, I've achieved more than I ever thought was possible, physically, emotionally, mentally. And that's when I, that was the utter prompt to, to, uh, to writing the book and thinking about, you know, those things that, yes, I do with companies in boardrooms, wherever, on the back of a motorbike, but actually we can do in all walks of life. I'm going to share 10 little things that might be interesting, might be useful. And my aim is that if one of them, there's one little thing that you go away with, that's that's been a great success so i'm just going to go through which might be interesting for you the first thing i think to think about a bit like success one of the things that i talk with a lot of my clients about is what does success mean for you and sometimes that definition is someone else's it's a parent it's a teacher's it's a boss's it's it's a professor it's it's someone that we've known in life but actually is it hours so actually defining what success is whether that's excellence leaving a legacy doing something different um having having an amazing home life if perhaps it wasn't for us or or, or it might be money or it might be cars or it might be where we live or it might be a title or it might be how many qualifications we have it doesn't matter what it is but it absolutely matters that it's yours and i think there's a similarity with that around creativity. What does creativity actually mean for you? For it to be to for it to be flowing, for it to be um, for it to be the thing that you really want to do. Whether that's whether that's in your professional life, whether that's in your garden, whether that's art, whether that's drawing, whether that's writing. You know, whatever it is. I think think about what being successful creatively means to you and again I was going to share a little exercise which um, I again I use a lot in businesses um, and with all sorts of people is thinking about all your senses so if you're thinking about your goal your creative goal or your, your dream or your passion whatever you want to do think about it in the context of all your senses so when you've achieved it what will it smell like what will it taste like? What will it look like? What will it feel like? And what will it sound like? You can imagine I get very kooky looks when I mention that in a business. But I remember, oh, it was years ago and I was near the uh, botanic, I'm, I'm going here, I'm not here, I'm in Huntingdon, but anyway, um, the Botanical Gardens in Cambridge. It was not a very lovely office. And I was working with a really small team of a, of a cutting edge little, little startup, tech startup. And the CEO happened to be next to me and he said, I can smell the carpet. And I looked down 
And it was one of those gray office carpets that's got lots of stains on it. And you think, I don't even want to look at that. And he said, no, no, not this carpet, Kate. The, the carpet in five years, when I've got 5,000 staff and I'm in four locations across the globe. He's now got 7,000 staff and he's right across the globe. But his olfactory sense was stronger than his other senses. And that's the one that drove him. So actually, sometimes really thinking about, you know, what is the thing that will help you really craft that goal, you know, whatever success or, or creativity means, means to you. Again, something, something to think about. Um, I think in order to, to be creative or to follow your path or follow your dream or learn to ride an off-road motorbike, a really simple thing, just start. <laughs> just start and do it. Um, as many of you know me, but you know, we have discussions about you know, when we're thinking about writing a book or doing a piece of art or planting an amazing garden or a fabulous box, um, window box or whatever it might be. When it's in our head, we're in complete control of it. It's beautiful, it's smart, it's measured. We know exactly what it looks like. But of course, the moment we start, other people get involved, momentum gets involved, other things happen, but we do have to start. And sometimes that tiny little daily deliberate action of just starting can be the most powerful thing that you do. And the other thing that I found, again, so powerful when I learned to ride a motorbike is talking to people that are experts and talking to people that know absolutely nothing about what you want to do, because they'll give you so much different information. Um, tiny little story, but when I lived in my last house, um, we were thinking about having a conservatory and a chap came round to do a quote. We didn't get a conservatory in the end. But anyway, a chap came round and he was just leaving and he had a white van and right on the bottom near his exhaust pipe, there was this tiny little logo for Achebe. And Achebe, um, for those of you who may ride motorbikes, is a really lovely off-road Italian brand. You know, it's black, it's very stylish, it's very lovely. And I saw this sticker. And as I say, we'd been talking about conservatory quotes. And I said to this chap, do you ride an off-road motorbike? He said, what's made you say that? I said, there's a sticker on your van. Anyway, he said, hang on a minute. And he opened the doors and there's a KTM and there's a Honda in the back of his van. And we have a big conversation. And he said, you need to know a chap called Martin Wittering. And he introduced me to him, who then introduced me to Billy Ward, who then introduced me to Ross Noble, who rides a motorbike and Charlie Borman and all sorts of people. It was just that asking. So whatever it is you want to do, talk to all sorts of people because you never know. You, you never know what might happen and he'd say, when someone came around to quote Princess for a conservatory, who knew where that journey would take? But you have to ask the question. I think there's also that element of um, when we're reaching, you know, seeking our goals is that we get stuck. We all get, of course, we get stuck. It, it's a very human thing. And I think if maybe this, you know, the, the, the awfulness of, of what's happened in, in the pandemic, but in some ways, it, you know, maybe the silver linings it's it's given us space to, to slow down and certainly I think when we're looking to achieve goals or reflect or achieve our potential we do have to slow down and engage our subconscious and I think one of those things that sometimes we're not as accomplished at or we don't maybe allow to happen is for that subconscious to noodle on things I'm sure many of you yourselves or people you know that you know have started a Zoom call at eight in the morning and then finished at seven at night. And you think, you know, that's a, a shed load of information for one's brain to noodle on subconsciously. So it's no wonder no one can sleep because there's no pauses. There's, there's no wonder to the coffee machine. There's no commute. There's, there's, there's no time for us to engage that um, subconscious brain and I'm sure as all of you know that it's a bit like an iceberg and the subconscious is massive and the conscious is is that if, if I did a drawing but I haven't got my um, flip chart with me here the conscious is the tiny bit so actually I think if you're feeling stuck give yourself some space give yourself some time to think about it but then go and start it sometimes helps um and once you've done that, keep going. It's a very, very easy thing to say, but I think, again, sometimes we forget we do it once and then we think, oh, well, yeah, that didn't work. I'm going to go and do something else now. 
well, doing it once isn't going to achieve anything. Um, when we're learning something new, we have to do it 21 times in order to learn whatever it is, whether that's tennis, whether it's the new way of doing something, whether it's presenting, whatever it might be. We have to do it 90 times in order for it to be us, sorry, in, in order for it to be embedded and for us to be accomplished at it. So we do have to keep on going. And as you'll know, there's, you know, people like JK Rowling who talked about the number of um, people that turned her down when she published her book and Thomas Edison, the number of ideas that he had before he finally came up with the light bulb. So, you know, sometimes when it's, when it's hard and again, the environment that we're, we're all living in at the moment, you know, there are some days when it, yeah, it's really, really tough, but actually that, art of you know keeping keeping on going and I'm uh I've written a book I'm in the throes of another at the moment and of course I always remember that Ernest Hemingway quote he said you must remember you can never edit an empty page and that goes for everything that we're doing so we do have to be a little bit mindful of that so what was I going to talk about next I think the next thing I was going to talk about is curiosity and again I love that um that quote of our Albert Einstein's, I'm going to get this wrong now. Um, he says, um, he said, it's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. <laughs> and again, for those of us that's got children in our lives, you think, well, yeah, there is an element of that. So I think, you know, when we're seeking to realize our potential to, to accomplish a goal, to, to, to do something different, you know, be curious. We've all got blind spots. And of course, just the definition of nature of a blind spot is such that we don't see it. So unless we say yes to things, we're never going to make that blind spot smaller or get to know what we don't know. I don't know if any of you remember a young lady called, um, I was about to say, isn't it ages me? So anyway, I'll, I'll just gloss over that lightly. Um, anyway, a lady called Alison Mowbray, who won silver in 2004 at the Olympics and she was a Olympic rower and she did quadruple skulls. I don't know if you recall her, but she was studying for a PhD in Cambridge in DNA strings. I can't tell you anymore because she told me a lot more and I can't remember it and didn't really understand, but she was looking for some sort of structure, molecular structure within DNA strings in Cambridge and it was cold and icy, I believe, and about minus two. And one of her flatmates said, um, I, I need someone to row for me because I need to practice. She said, I'm not rowing. I'm not going on the river. I've got my I've got my thesis to write. I'm not going on the river. Anyway, her mate bore her down and she got on the river. And she went on to become an Olympic silver medalist at at. Uh, at rowing so you know that was curiosity she eventually went for it and we you know if we don't say yes and we don't explore those things that actually maybe we're a bit resistant to you know who knows where it might take us and, and we sort of don't know um have any of you read um um, raise your hand if you have creativity it's a book that John Cleese has just brought out it's tiny it's a tiny little book called creativity I love John Cleese and uh, he was talking about it on the radio the other day so I bought it and it, it, you read it in about an hour and he's just talking about creativity and you know in his life and there was one little bit that really really made me laugh because he was talking about fear and panic and he said um it just said in his book he said who of us when we're in a panic decides that we need to go to sleep he said you don't you don't decide in the middle of a panic that you need a bit of a doze and you know you think what's well, a bit of a funny sentence what's that all about there but of course he, what he meant was is when we're fearful or in a panic or in a tears about something that is a lot of energy bouncing up and down that we've got to do something with and of course I, I, I've ridden horses in the past and I always liken it to you, you have to get the energy to move forward we have to be moving forward towards something and so I think, you know, and so he was saying in this book, and I, you know, I, I know from, you know, when I read the motorbike and all sorts of things, you know, use that energy. And if it's, if it's fearful energy, because fear is a big one that can trip us all up, you know, can trip us up a bit, you know, write stuff down again to, to engage the subconscious, you know, what are we worried about? I was never really frightened about my motorbike actually I don't think I was actually frightened about falling off I fell off masses crikey ridiculous but I probably was worried about hurting myself it's a bit like doing a presentation are we worried about the presentation about the content about what we do probably not 
but we worry about the audience reaction. That might have been a bit of a silly thing to say just then, but anyway, that's out there now. Um, so, you know, sometimes thinking about what we're actually fearful of and actually how it manifests for us, you know, is it lower back? Is it feeling a bit hot? Is it, you know, what happens so that we know the trigger and then we can do something with the energy to then engage our subconscious. So when we have got that panic or that fear going on, um, you know, write, write it down and, and think about it. And I think the other thing to that, which again is quite useful is when we're thinking about what we, what we can do, being very mindful of our thought and our mood, because of course our thought and our mood will interpret what we create. Um, and I know from writing, you know, the dark chapters are definitely on the days when I've not been feeling happy and jolly and vice versa. So, but I think taking that a step further, being mindful of your self-talk, because the self-talk that can talk you out of things can be so powerful. You know, if you've spilled coffee, for example, and you call yourself a bloody idiot and you think, well, you really spilled coffee. It's not that bad. Sorry, excuse my language there. I know you're recording, any little thing. Um, so, you know, what is that? What is that, you know, self-language, you know, the language that we're using to ourselves that actually might be really damaging that we're not aware of. I spoke with a client, I had a session with a client um, a couple of days ago, and it was so fascinating. So I said to her in the middle of the call, I just stopped the call and I said, do you know every sentence that you start every sentence with, I don't think. I don't think, you know, if I could, I don't, but it was all, I don't think, you know, that I, that's not going to be possible. And I said, well, could we just maybe change that to, I do think, what do you think? And again, it was subconscious. She said, do I really say that? I said, yes, you do. She said, well, whatever. Anyway, a couple of minutes later, she said, I do say that, don't I? I said, yes, you do. So, you know, so sometimes just raising it into our awareness. So we're more aware of how we're talking to ourselves. Cause you know, as you'll all know, we generally talk to ourselves in a, in a far worse manner than we talk to anyone else or that we wouldn't even dream of talking to someone else. So again, from a fear and a, and a, a perspective of managing that to get the best outcome, being mindful. Um, so, it, and, and on that, just a final bit on that point about what you can do, you can always ask for help. You can always, we don't always do it. When I talked earlier about you know the fact I've met Charlie Borman and I've met Ross Noble, I wasn't I wasn't showing off. I didn't know any of these people, but I asked I asked for help, and it just happened. And and I I got taught by these people a bit like um and again I think Sasha knows this story. There was a there's a chap called Rene Cariol who many of you may have heard of, or not. He's he's very he's very I found him hugely inspirational. He's um he's advi he advised Kofi Annan in the past, and he um he was get this right the first black and youngest um, person to sit on a, the board of a British company. And he sat on the board of Marks and Spencer. And I wrote to him 10 years ago, because I and just said, I'd really love to spend 20 minutes, half an hour speaking to you because I love what you do. And I didn't hear anything for about, I don't know, months, didn't hear anything for months. And then I got an email and he said, um, would you join me at Claridge's for dinner with a number of other label company directors and all sorts of people? At which point I absolutely freaked because I was just quite happy to have a little telephone call with him. That would have been lovely. So all of a sudden, this was just a terrifying prospect, but it was amazing. It was brilliant. I was terrified, but it was great. Um, but then three years ago, three, yeah, three years ago, met him 10 years ago, three years ago, we went out to Washington together and did a load of work for the World Bank. So but it, it's just, you know, put yourself out there and ask. The worst that's going to happen is it will slip into ether. Well, never mind, work on someone else. But I think sometimes, you know, you'll know all of this and it's sort of reminding you of it, really. You know, those 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 things that we can do. Just looking at the time and I can see Sasha looking at the time. But I've got a little bit more time. <laughs> Two more things. <laughs> um, I can talk about a contradiction. I think the power of stillness, again, tapping back to meditative practice, being in the moment and being still is hugely powerful in terms of letting your subconscious think. But I want to think, thought even, but I want to add to that to contradict. And I know some of you are scientists and engineers, so apologies in advance. You might want to fiddle when you're being still. This is, this is a crystal. So for those of you who think crystals are, are mad, it's just a little rock or it might be a pen, doesn't matter what you fiddle with, or you might do a doodle. 
because actually when you're doodling or when you're fiddling with something else, and again, the, the neuroscientific studies are quite interesting because they're not sure which part of the brain is being engaged. But what they do know for certain is that when people are fiddling, when they're listening to something, their focus and attention is so much better. Nice, he's nodding there. You know, and generally people will retain about 29% more information than those that don't. I discovered this morning that, let me get this right. Where did I write the fact? 26 of the last 44 presidents doodled. Don't know about the last one. But anyway, I thought that was a very interesting fact. And they've got they've got pictures of their cartoons and all sorts of things. So so that power of stillness and actually the power of doodling is something to be really mindful of. I, I did a um a session many years ago and I remember that one of the directors of this company drew the most beautiful picture of a, of a building in the rose garden that was out where we were working but he didn't miss anything so again just something to ponder when you're when you're thinking about something that's really important and I was just going to leave you with <laughs> believing in yourself don't forget belief I think I, I put a quote on Insta earlier, actually, and it said, you know, you're always a belief away from your greatest achievement, your greatest breakthrough or your greatest love. And belief is so powerful, but it's also very hard. When I was in Wales learning to ride motorbike, I was on a gravel track it was raining, but it wasn't the vertical, it was the sideways rain. And it was really cold. And I was on the biggest bike I'd ever ridden in my life. And I just thought, I can't, I can't do this. I hadn't, this was a long time before I got to the mountains. Anyway, I was just, I was going along about 40 miles an hour. I don't think I was crying, but I was thinking that that, that was an option. And all of a sudden this bike, this chap overtook me. I can turn around now because he turned side saddle and that was really cool. And he was doing about 70 miles an hour. And he turned back and he looked at me and went, you can do this, Kate. And then he sped off. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I can. Maybe I can do this. So if you have to borrow belief from someone else, go ahead. I believe in you. And I know many of you will be thinking, well, how can you believe in me? Because you don't know us. No, I don't know you. I know some of you. But I do know that you're here now and you're interested and that you've shown up. And I absolutely know from my day job that showing up is well over 50% of achieving whatever it is that you want to achieve. So I believe in you and go for it. And I wish you all the very best. <laughs> wow, Kate Tojero for you tonight. <laughs>